camera companies are lying to you about what really matters. And in this video, we're gonna talk about five of the biggest lies they tell and how you can avoid being influenced by them. Now we all know that camera companies are in the business of making money and while I don't really have a problem with that, I'm starting to get a little bit annoyed by the constant barrage of camera marketing that comes my way. I mean my social media feeds are full of gear ads, my email seems to have been distributed to like a million different promo lists and of course I soak up the YouTube filmmaking content just like the rest of you. And with this like fire hose of advertising comes a ton of misinformation on what really matters in a solid camera for documentary filmmaking and I'm getting a little bit sick of it. So in this video, I'm going to get into five of the lies that camera companies want you to believe so they can get as much of your cash as possible. And then I'm going to give my take on why these things actually don't matter nearly as much as they want you to think they do. At the end, I'll list off the things that actually matter to me in a professional camera. And hopefully that helps some of you out there to see through all the noise and save your cash for the things that count. <music> Okay, so seeing as we're just coming out of the holiday season and all the insane consumerism that brings these days, <laughs> I guess a good starting point for this video would be one of the things that bothers me most about how the camera gear industry operates. Some companies are better than others, but it feels to me like the upgrade schedule is getting out of control. Like every year there's a new model of Sony A7 whatever, or a brand new drone from DJI that makes your old one look like garbage. For me, DJI is the absolute worst example of this because every time they put out a new product, which is very often, pretty much none of the accessories you already have will work. Like, why is the battery on the Mavic 3 Pro and the Mavic 3 Air not the same? If you look at them side by side, they're virtually identical in size, so how hard would it be to make the same batteries work across different products instead of making us constantly throw out or try to sell what we have if we wanna upgrade? But this isn't an environmental rant. This is mainly about creating the perception that older gear won't do the job so that if you want to make good work you feel like you need to upgrade it. The thing is that's a complete lie. Now I know I have a lot of gear by most people's standards but I really do try to buy as little as possible. Everything I keep around does get used and I make a point sometimes to my own detriment to use things until the bitter end meaning that I don't generally upgrade anything until the old one is dead. Like at the end of last year I was shooting on a survival series with a budget in the tens of millions of dollars and my main drone for the first half of the run was a Mavic Air 2, a drone that had been technically obsoleted by a bunch of newer drones already. The thing is, it worked just great and nobody ever commented on the footage not looking good enough, so why should I upgrade? Now obviously, if drones are a huge part of your business, then that's a different story. And like always, I'm speaking in generalities here, so if there's a reason you need to upgrade, then upgrade. You know what your business needs a lot better than I do at the end of the day. Anyways, when I eventually fatally crashed that Air 2 after three plus years of heavy use and multiple rounds of repairs, I upgraded to the 3 and it is better, no doubt about it. I'm happy it's in my kit. But if that crash hadn't happened, I would have held on as long as humanly possible despite being shown DJI ads and influencer collaborations pretty much everywhere I look online. So if you're feeling the pressure to upgrade but the gear you already have is still doing the job, hopefully seeing this gives you some encouragement not to succumb to the marketing hype and just stick with what you have. Next up, I want to touch on a mistake I see from a ton of newer filmmakers who I talk to on one-on-one -on -one consoles consultation calls, and that's whether or not they need a full frame camera because the dominant marketing messages these days seems to be that full frame equals better. And yes, if you have deep pockets or you're a working professional, then sure, having a full frame sensor is nice. But is it better or do you need one? I really don't think so. When I first started out, and don't worry, I'm not about to go into a big back in the day tangent. When I was 17. But even 10 years ago, there weren't many options out there for full frame cameras. That's a big reason why the 5D Mark II was such a game changer. But for the most part, everyone, including Hollywood DPs, were still shooting Super 35. So much of the best glass out there from Hollywood favorites like the Cook S4s to my personal favorite documentary lenses, the Zeiss Super Speeds, they're all Super 35 coverage only. And so insisting on full frame can even hold you back in some ways. And when it comes to image quality, my feeling is that these days it's pretty much impossible to find a cinema camera that doesn't look great no matter the size of the sensor. I mean, okay, if you're Roger Deakins and you're shooting 1917 and you think a bigger sensor is gonna improve the look of things for an IMAX display, 
That's another story, but I've worked on a lot of really high-end documentaries over the years with some of the best DPs in the business, and I honestly don't think any of them would have a problem shooting Super 35 instead of full frame. In fact, when I think about it, some of the best shows I worked on in the last few years, like Trafficked with National Geographic, or The Business of Drugs for Netflix, or The Trade for Showtime, all of those were shot on Super 35 sensors. The takeaway here isn't that I don't like full frame, it's that anyone or any brand that tries to tell you you need a full frame camera to make good work is lying to you. There are things that really do matter when picking a camera, and I'll get into those in a bit, but a full frame sensor is not one of them. And speaking of sensors, the next marketing buzzword that I think pretty much is totally irrelevant these days is resolution. I'm not gonna spend much time on this because it's pretty simple. For about 95% of people watching, any resolution above 4K just doesn't matter. But Luke, I can hear screaming from the comments, I work in motion graphics or I'm a high-end commercial shooter and I use 8K all the time. Fantastic. That's great, I'm glad it's working for you. But for almost everyone else, and especially if you're focused primarily on documentaries like I am, you don't need anything better than 4K. And there's even an argument that you don't even need 4K because a lot of shows still deliver a 1080 output. I shot 1080 for 120 days this year, and that show is gonna play all over the world on a major network, but I do admit that it's maybe a bit of an outlier these days because 4K is mostly the standard. If you disagree with me here, you can let me know why in the comments, but from my own personal example, Examples, even though my main camera shoots 6K, I pretty much never use it. When you shoot hours and hours of footage a day like I do, the larger files that come with high res footage is actually a negative, not a positive. So yes, 4K looks like it's gonna be the standard for most stuff, and it does make sense to invest in a camera that's 4K capable. It isn't necessary though, but anything higher than that, at least for the foreseeable future, is overkill for most people and just a lot of marketing hype. Nothing else really to say there, so let's just leave it and move on. Now, I've spent the last few minutes mostly talking about things that are overblown marketing ploys, but I just wanna shift gears here for a second and talk about something that I think is totally worth the hype, and that's this cool new piece of audio post-production tech called Link Match AI. If you haven't heard of it, it's basically like a reverse Shazam for finding music for your filmmaking projects which might sound weird, but let me explain what I'm talking about. Have you ever heard a song on the radio or in a movie or maybe pumping out of an H&M changing room and thought, this would be perfect for my project? Normally you'd have to go on your royalty-free music service of choice, which in my case is audio and who is kindly sponsoring this video, and then you'd hunt around for something based on mood and genre, and then go through one by one until something works. And I do still look for music that way, but it can be a bit of a slog when you're trying to match something specific and can't quite find it. That's where Link Match comes in. So let me give you a personal example. I was recently watching the movie End of Watch with Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena, which is sort of like this slick action cop movie with a lot of mood and style to it. It's no cinematic masterpiece, but it's really fun to watch and it's full of style. There's one scene where they use a song by Public Enemy and I thought it was a great fit for the montage scene. Let me just play a few seconds of it here so you get an idea. Now obviously I can't afford to license a public enemy song, but Link Match can help you get most of the way there a lot faster. So if I just copy the link from the public enemy song, go into Link Match and hit paste, it's gonna give me a list of all the things in audio's library that are pretty close. Then I can just flip through them really quickly, play a few seconds of each until I find something that fits or matches the mood that I'm looking for, and then download the song and I'm done. This can be especially helpful when you're looking for songs that you don't know how to really describe in terms of mood or, or genre. I personally think this is a really cool piece of tech that's gonna help me out a lot as I put together edits, and thanks to Audio for helping create it and for sponsoring this video. There's a link in the description where you can use the code LUKE70 to save 70% on their pro plan, which brings the cost down to $59 a year, which is a crazy deal. And now let's get back to the video. The next thing I wanna to touch on is an old nemesis of mine, and I'm constantly pushing people to get away from using it in their documentary shooting, and that's autofocus. <laughs> Now don't misunderstand me, autofocus can be a huge help, and I will use it for specific things, like as a second camera angle on an interview, or for shooting a gimbal, or maybe tracking very fast moving subjects. But for actually covering a real scene, like a moment in time that develops characters and advances your story, I personally don't know any high level DPs who use autofocus. Manual focus is so much better for being intentional and flowing with the moment, and it just looks organic and natural, whereas autofocus looks like a 
robot is operating the camera. This isn't about why everyone should get more comfortable with manual focus though, it's about how every new camera and lens seems to tout the blazing fast autofocus as one of its primary selling points. And while that's cool and really useful for photography, in video autofocus has been pretty good for a while and it's hard to find a modern camera that isn't good enough to cover a sit down interview or a gimbal shot. If you do something niche where having the very best autofocus on the market makes your jobs easier, then by all means buy away. But since most of us should be using manual focus anyways, it's not something that I even take into consideration when I'm looking at a new camera. So if you've been holding off on a camera you really like the look of because you're worried it doesn't have the same autofocus speed as whatever the newest and best is in that space, I would just ignore it because there are so many more features that matter that I'll cover more in a second. But first there's one final marketing lie that I want to dispel and that's the idea that everything has to be new all the time. Or to put that another way, don't sleep on used gear. Online influencers are probably as much to blame for this as the gear companies, and this relentless push for new, 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 more, more, more is a big reason why I won't do unboxing videos on this channel. Because I don't want to play up the newness of gear by making plastic wrap ASMR content and getting people all excited by the huge boxes and beautiful graphic design because it's just encouraging consumerism. I personally think that all products should come in plain brown cardboard boxes with as little plastic as possible because, let's face it, if you're buying filmmaking gear in in the first place, your carbon footprint is probably pretty high already. I digress again though, because this isn't a video about making good environmental choices, it's about ignoring all the ads and buying used gear if you can. I've already said this a bunch of times on the channel, but apart from my FX3, I've never bought a new camera, from the stills cameras I learned on as a photojournalist, and all my cinema cameras later, from my FS5 to the FS7 and the FX9 I use currently. And I did try to get the FX3 used as well, but the camera was brand new when I needed it, and I live in Canada, where the market for buying used gear is smaller than in the US, so there were no used options. The truth is though that there is so much life left in our gear than we take advantage of, and that's especially true when it comes to higher end gear. Okay, so maybe the bottom end mirrorless cameras might be a little sketchy after five years, but a professional camera is usually built to a higher specification, and so there are some insane deals to be had out there. Like right now you can find an old FS7 on eBay that's fully functioning and in great shape for less than the price of a Sony a7C, and I've shot dozens of films on those things that are still playing on Netflix and National Geographic and all sorts of big networks. The same goes for Canon C300s or Arri Alexas or Red Whatevers, if that's what you're into. I mean, you're not getting an Arri for two grand, but the deals are there, you know what I mean. Buying new just means you're gonna eat the cost of an asset that depreciates about as fast as a new car when you drive it off the lot. So unless there's a reason you really need to buy something new, try to ignore the shiny ads and unboxing videos and see if you can't save a bunch of cash on something used. So then, if those are all the things that I don't care about, what's actually important for me in a camera? Well, rugged build quality is right at the top for me because as you might imagine from someone who buys everything used, I want my stuff to last a very long time. A camera that you have to baby is not an asset, it's a liability. And I wanna get my gear out into the world in shooting, not display it in custom build Pelican cases. Weather sealing and burly construction count for a lot more than autofocus and resolution in my world. And I also really value battery life because I don't shoot in studios most of the time, and if a camera chews through batteries, it just means I have to carry more with me. I also want the ability to use as many different lenses as possible, so I'd love for it to be easily converted to other lens mounts, which is a big part of the reason why I think Sony cameras are so good these days. I can put anything from a PL mount anamorphic monster to a Canon macro lens on my camera, and that opens up so many creative choices that you don't really have with all the other brands. Professional audio is also extremely important to me, and that means the ability to have more than one audio input at a time because if I can't run a shotgun and a lav at the same time, it's really hard to follow a character and tell a good story. That's one instance where the marketing for the FX3 really did get me because it was the first time I'd seen a mirrorless camera with two XLR ports and I jumped on just a couple weeks later after it was announced. Because at the end of the day, I'm just as susceptible to all the marketing hype as everyone else and I have to stop myself from filling up BNH shopping carts all the time. Look, marketing works and online influencers, like and subscribe, are just as guilty as the camera companies when it comes to getting us to buy stuff that we don't really need. So if this video has done anything, I just hope it makes you stop for a second before swiping that credit card and make sure you're buying things for the right reasons. If you want something that is worth the investment though, don't forget to try out Link Match for yourself at a massive 70% discount by using the code LUKE70 and you'll get a year's worth of royalty free music at the same time. How's that for marketing? See ya.